Good morning. Grace and peace to you this beautiful Sunday morning. As you know, we're, we're here with a little different circumstance than what we, we normally gather. Uh, so a couple of uh, announcements up front here. We are going to live stream today's service. So if your uh, cell phones are uh, connected to Wi-Fi, we ask that you turn those off or turn your cell phones to uh, airplane mode. We just want to make sure that uh, we've got enough bandwidth to be able to uh, uh, live stream without any interruption for those of our family that are joining the, this morning from uh, the comforts of their own home. Um, a, as you know, uh, with the uh, coronavirus uh, threat in our country, uh, we're, we're dealing with a little bit different circumstance here inside of the church, and we're trying to be uh, very considerate of, of others, our brothers and sisters, those that uh, may have some immunosuppressive uh, issues, health issues that are very susceptible to the, uh, the virus. Uh, we're trying to offer special consideration to them and, and to be wise in these, uh, these circumstances, uh, but yet uh, still not neglect our uh, uh, own worship of the Lord on, on this his day. Uh, so we appreciate your patience as we uh, try to work through uh, all of this. We're taking uh, several steps today in the way that we conduct our services. Uh, uh, the first was we have uh, postponed uh, indefinitely our, our Sunday morning and Sunday evening worship as well as uh, any uh, service of food like our fellowship uh, meals. Uh, Wednesday evenings have been postponed as well. Uh, the pastor sent out a, a letter that uh, all of you should have received. If you haven't or if you're visiting with us, please just let us know and we'll make sure to get that information in your hands. But uh, offering some alternate uh, forms of, of worship. Uh, the thing that we don't want to do is take a vacation from worship during this time. Uh, this is a time for us to more intently uh, focus on, on him and to understand through all of this that this isn't uh, some rogue molecule that has gotten out of control. In God's providence, he is, he is fully aware of the situation. He hasn't uh, left us. This is part of uh, his plan. Uh, so keep that in mind as, as we react uh, calmly to this. Uh, we worship a a great and a mighty God, and there's no reason for us uh, to fear whatsoever. So with that, we're going to uh, continue on uh, with our service. We're a little sketchy on announcements this week, other than those that I just shared with you. Uh, if you're visiting with us, please uh, visit uh, covenantpca.com, and you can see a list of all of our, our schedules. Uh, we'll do our best to keep you informed as we move forward. So normally during this time, I would ask you to take the, uh, the green registers and pass them across the aisle and fill those out so that we can have an accurate count of who's here, get you information if you're a visitor. We're just going by word of mouth today. Uh, we're, we're not going to do that. We've also altered the way that we're going to receive this morning's offering. So rather than, than passing the offering plates, uh, you'll see down at your feet, uh, between the legs of the of this chair in front of you, there's an envelope that you can put your offering in and just pass it to the closest aisle on the outside, if if you would, and that'll that'll uh, minimize the number of hands that are are touching things. Uh, parents, if your if your children uh, are of that age where they think that their nose is a parking spot for their finger, maybe you can. Uh, instruct them a little bit on the uh, the hazards of that behavior and uh, one of those things that you have to to leave to come into adulthood so it's a good time to start now so um, this morning uh, we're gathered to worship our Lord and Savior uh, during the musical prelude I, I just ask that you would put aside the tyranny of the urgent, the things that are bothering you, being nervous about uh, what's going on in, in the world right now, put those aside and rest in the Lord. Uh, calm your heart as we prepare ourselves to come into worship.
Please take your bulletin, uh, your Blue Trinity hymnals, and your Bible, and stand with me for the call to worship, if you're able. The call to worship this morning is Psalm 105, verses 1 through 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Our hymn of praise this morning is number 18. pray. Our Heavenly Father, Almighty, wonderful, majestic God, we come into your presence this morning praising your name, thankful and rejoicing that we have been given new life, eternal life by the Holy Spirit who indwells us and works every day to conform us to the image of our Savior in whom we rely upon and trust in. We're thankful for your goodness and your grace, our great God. We're thankful that this morning as we gather together and as we ask you, we are confident that you will clear the thoughts of our mind, that you will remove the burdens that we bring with us, the concerns, the fears, Lord, the anxiousness that we may have begun this day with. And instead, Lord, you would shout your grace, replacing that fear with rejoicing replacing anxiousness with peace, that as we gather together this morning to commune and fellowship with you, Lord, we ask that you would, would take away the distractions that are in our hearts, the things of tomorrow that we can leave for tomorrow. Instead, let us rest in you today. And as we gather, we also pray together as our Savior taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. We serve a God who is faithful to forgive the sins of his people when we come to him in repentance. Let's do that now. Let's come to our great God by faith as we all pray together out loud our confession of sin that you find in our bulletin. O Lord God, whose compassion is new every day, we have sinned grievously in our daily walk before others. We have not thought of your spirit with the high thoughts he deserves. We have grieved him by the things we have said and done. We have not walked happily with him as he so clearly commands and richly deserves. We have lied to him and harmed his fame by our deeds. We have not submitted to his loving discipline as we ought. We come now in the name of our resurrected and exalted Savior, pleading for your forgiveness and cleansing from our heinous sins. Amen. Christian, having prayed that prayer by faith, hear now God's proclamation of pardon from his word. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Having confessed our sin and having hearing God's proclamation of pardon, let us now confess together what we believe regarding the church. The visible church, which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, not confined to one nation, as before under the law, consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children, and is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there is ordinary possibility of salvation. section and of course on the edges we don't have envelopes as uh, you'll be able to reach uh, the deacon as he brings the plate for your offering. So let us now give to the Lord as we continue to worship him as we prepare our hearts as our deacon Eric Schmidt leads us in prayer. Father what a comfort it is to know that your steadfast love endures forever that you care for and provide for us so we ask that uh, we would be encouraged, that we would not be anxious about tomorrow, of uh, what we'll eat or what we'll wear, or the other concerns in the body, but that we would be encouraged by your reminder to us in your word to consider the, the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, that they don't sow or reap or spin, and yet you provide for them all that they need. And so how much more so you, our Heavenly Father, provide those things that we need who are your children. Hmm. We ask that you would help us now to seek your kingdom and to be faithful and generous in our giving. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen.
prayer is the chief exercise of our faith. So let us, let us partake of that right now as we go to our great God and enjoy the benefit of being adopted into his family. We might cry out, Abba, Father, bringing our needs to him, praising him, bringing the needs of our neighbors as well. So let us pray. Lord Almighty, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are great and greatly to be praised. For you alone are the one true and living God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who is and was and forever will be. There is none like you, enthroned in majesty above all of your creation, above the heavens and the earth. There is none creator, ruler, and sustainer of all things but you. And you alone are worthy of all praise and glory. As we gather this morning together as your people, we gather with, with rejoicing and with thankful hearts. As we are thankful to be your people. That we might cry out to you, the God who loved us before we loved you. Our great shepherd who cares for our every need. That we might confidently live our lives in union with Christ, knowing that there is nothing that may separate us from you. And Lord, we, we rejoice that it is your perfect will that is always done, that you've decreed all things, that we might rest in your providence with contentment. That Lord, we have no reason to be anxious or fearful, but by your grace, we are able to rest in your goodness. And we ask that you would, would do that for us, that you would grow our faith for it is weak, that you would shower us with your grace, that we might to a full measure understand your peace that is beyond the understanding of, of any mere mortal. Lord, we're thankful that you're a God who who loves to save sinners. That, Lord, you are the, the only one who is able to grant true and real, lasting and eternal peace. And as we praise you for the gift that you've given to us of, of salvation and peace with you, Lord, we ask that you would, would give this gift of free salvation to our friends and family who do not know Christ, Lord, to our neighbors who are spiritually dead, living in darkness. We ask that you would, would use us, that we might be a means, that the Holy Spirit would use in, in the sharing of the hope that we have in Christ with others. That, Lord, even as we hear around us this coming week, words and, and thoughts that may be fearful, that you'd give us boldness to speak words of life and hope, that we would bring your, your scriptures to bear and that we would point others to Christ, the only hope, that we would share the gospel and that you would use this little local congregation here in Oak Ridge to your glory as we seek to support the preaching of the gospel around the world in many places as well as as we seek to preach the, the gospel purely here from the pulpit covenant and as we seek to be a church that is faithful to you in all things committed to our Savior and his word. Lord we ask that you would bring forth great fruit from that and that we would be a small part of what you were doing in the growing of your kingdom. Lord, we ask that you would, would not only continue to call in the lost, those elect that you have decreed, that the Spirit would bring them in, that be baptized and adopted into your family, that, that not only would we continue to see that, but, but as they join with us, we would see all of your people growing in maturity and sanctification, that, Lord, we would... We'd be more and more like our Savior every day. We ask that you would, 
would cause the elders, not only here at Covenant, but throughout Tennessee Valley Presbytery and the Presbyterian Church in America and throughout your church across this world, Lord, use them to equip the saints that your people might bring forth great fruit in every area of their life as they use the gift that you've given to them to, to care for one another in the body of Christ and also as they, they go into each and every day and bring your word to bear in every situation. Lord, we, we lift up to you the needs of, of your church and the needs of our neighbors as we continue to hear of the coronavirus, COVID-19 across the world and, and even here in our land. Lord, we ask that you would, would heal your world of this, that you would rid this pestilence from our midst, that you would calm the anxiousness and the fearfulness that is around us, that perhaps even some of us may be suffering from. Lord, we pray that you would protect even those in our midst who are recovering from surgery now, those who, who may be sick, that you would bring healing and give wisdom to the doctors. And Lord, ultimately we trust in you. We ask that you would, would remove from us the burdens that weigh us down, that we might be quick to flee to the cross of Christ, that we may not look to ourselves for strength, but that we would look to you that we might be strengthened by your grace. Lord, you are the great physician of body and soul. You are our creator. You made us. You're the giver of all life. So we ask that you would protect and deliver your people and that you would be glorified in all things. This we pray, Father, in the power of the Spirit, in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7, we're going to be reading verses 9 through 14. As, as this morning we're looking at the kingdom of God, as we've even confessed from our confession of faith regarding the church. We see this aspect of the kingdom of God, that there is a, a now and a not yet. Now we're going to turn to Daniel 7 and see how God reveals a glimpse of the everlasting kingdom of God. Daniel 7, starting in chapter 9. This is God's perfect, holy, and errant, and sufficient word. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came out one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Well, having... We heard from God, let us now minister to one another and praise him by singing his word to him. If you'll take hold of the maroon book of Psalms for singing that's there in front of you, if you're able, let's stand together. We're going to turn to 51E and sing this psalm of confession and repentance. 51E.
and please be seated. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we're thankful for this day that you've given to us to delight in you. We ask that you would would be our hope. Our joy would be rested in you. And as we open your word, we hear it read and preached that the Spirit would move mightily. That we might see the, the lost converted and your people built up into the image of our Savior. In whose name we pray. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, we'll be reading and looking at verses 1 through 6. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. And as you're turning in your Bibles, I remind you that Luke is written to confirm the certainty of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that again today, this morning. Luke chapter 9. Verses 1 through 6. This is speaking of Christ. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, And do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Unless you've been hiking the Appalachian Trail for the last four months and have had no access to the internet, news, or any other human being, uh, you're aware that uh, there's a little bit of a concern over coronavirus, COVID-19. It started on the other side of the world, literally, and has worked its way here to our nation. It's something that that everybody seems to be talking about and everybody seems to have uh, an opinion about in regards to, to what's going on and what the concerns should actually be. And while I don't study uh, epidemiology, I do by God's grace study theology. And while Pastor Nick is a doctor, he's not a medical doctor, but he is a doctor of theology. So while your elders are not medical doctors, we are Christ's servants who serve him by serving you. We have a great love for him and a great love for his people. And as we we think about this great truth of our service and our calling to you, that's why we've taken some of the steps that were announced this morning and you've seen in the emails out of great caution, but yet at the same time balancing great responsibility that we have to minister God's word in homes but also here in the local congregation from the pulpit. God's word is powerful and that is what the spirit uses. You know there's as I mentioned opinions all over the place and there seem to be two extremes. If you're driving down the road of COVID-19 there's there's a ditch on both sides. One side of the ditch, I've heard some people say, this is the apocalypse. It is the end of all things. That's why I'm going to buy everything I can find. The other side of the road, the other ditch is, this is a hoax. This isn't really a big deal. And I'm going to laugh at you because you mentioned it. I think we're probably somewhere in the middle. Again, I don't study epidemiology, I study theology, but I think it's safe to say we're somewhere in the middle there. But one thing is definitely sure. While we may not know exactly where we can place in that line what exactly is going on with COVID-19, we know that your neighbors are fearful, they're anxious, 
and they're worried. And some of them are even panicking in the midst of this news and what they're seeing and experiencing. We had friends send us a video through social media yesterday. One of the big warehouses, you know, the warehouse stores where you get like the 50 gallon tubs of peanut butter. Yesterday, the line to get in the store was wrapped halfway around the building. And people were sitting there with their carts wanting to get in and just, I guess, buy anything that they could or what they don't have. There are states that are now posting warnings saying, drinking bleach will not prevent or cure COVID-19. I think you've got to be pretty fearful to be drinking bleach, to be waiting outside for hours to get into a store. The anxiousness, the fearfulness of our neighbors is real. You know, it's wise to follow doctor's counsel in preventing the spread of germs and, and sickness. That's why we've done some of the things we have. It's good to be concerned about it. But with the level of fear and anxiety and panic over COVID-19 that we've seen building and building and now coming to a, an even higher level, it indicates our neighbor's great need for Jesus. A great need for salvation that would grant them the ability to rest in God's perfect sovereign grace. So let us respond as the church always has with confidence in Christ and love for our neighbors. You know, 500 years ago, the reformer Martin Luther wrote this about epidemics. He wrote, you ought to think this way. Of course, he's writing to Christians. Very well, by God's decree, the enemy has sent us poison and deadly awful. Therefore, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate help purify the air, administer medicine, and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me, and I have done what he has expected of me. And so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. 500 years ago, ample good advice for today as we look at how the church has responded to situations similar to what we are in the midst of, and yet even sometimes much, much worse. So as Christians, trust our Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Trust, as he tells us, that nothing can separate you from him and his love. For Christians, trust that God is in control, and we trust that God is good, and we trust that God's ways are better than our own. So trusting God, let us now look at our passage this morning to how God grows his kingdom. That we might trust the ways that he has chosen. We might trust his perfect providence as he brings it about. So as we look at these, these few verses here in the beginning of chapter 9, by God's grace, I want you to see that, that God grows his kingdom through the faithful preaching of the gospel. We're going to look at two simple things. Jesus gives the twelve power and authority, and Jesus sends the twelve to proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus gives the twelve power and authority. First thing we see is, as we look to this is Jesus empowers the twelve with dominion over the demonic. You remember that we've already seen Christ's power and authority over the demonic, and now he, he gives that power and authority to the twelve. So the incarnation, as we looked at that, it seems like ages ago now, but it was just a few months ago. But to the incarnation of Christ, what we really saw was, was a great spiritual D-Day. As our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, came, invaded the kingdom of Satan to crush it, that he might redeem his people, 
his bride, the church that the Father gave to him. And Jesus even says in Matthew 12, you turn to verse 28, that, that his casting out of demons, what this really is, is, is a sign that testifies to the truth that the kingdom of God is here. It has arrived. It is one of the things that, that shows that and proves that. And the power and authority over demons is now given to the twelve that they might go out in this mission to preach the gospel. And as they go from city to city, they're given dominion over the devils that they might cast them out. Again, testifying to the truth that they are bringing God's word, that they are bringing the true gospel, and that God's kingdom has arrived. What God's people have been waiting for is here and this power and authority that they're given in this testifies to that truth. Now, there was a shelf life to this, to this gift. So you shouldn't expect the elders of covenant to be going out casting out demons. That's not the point here. But at the same time, don't miss the fact that the elders of covenant are going to war right behind our captain against the devils. We don't sit back. We don't think that there is no real spiritual conflict happening. But we use the weapons that God has given to us, his word and prayer. And by faith and his grace, we use it. And we go to war against the devil as we follow our captain, our king. And Jesus, he gives the elders power and authority to wield these weapons for his glory and for the benefit of his people. But he also, he also shows that these weapons are important. You can't miss it as you move through the, the New Testament. It's clear that elders are called to shepherd. They're under shepherds of Christ. They're called to shepherd God's people to live amongst and in the flock as one of the sheep ministering to the other sheep. In Acts chapter 20, you read in verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Elders, you've been called to shepherd and care for the church that was bought by the blood of Christ. And we read in, in James, the end of the letter of James in chapter 5. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Well, faithful elders are, are called to the role of shepherding to use the weapons they've been giving God's word and prayer. And as they shepherd amongst and in the flock, that power and authority given to them, lovingly rebuking, lovingly encouraging, seeking to show their dominion over the demonic as they make war with the devil. So Jesus empowers the twelve with dominion over the demonic, but Jesus also empowers the twelve with dominion over sickness. Again, this power and authority is, is given to the twelve. We've already seen, moving our way through, that, that Jesus he has power and authority over sickness. We've already seen where he's healed. We've already seen where he has, has raised individuals from death. He has complete power and authority over these things and, and he's giving that to the twelve that they might go out in this preaching ministry and as they heal again it's testifying to the truth that what they are preaching is God's word and that the kingdom of God has arrived now there's a as I mentioned earlier a lot of fear and anxiousness across the world across our nation in Tennessee, even in Oak Ridge, Knoxville area, a lot of unknownness. 
concern and, and fear for this COVID-19. And it's interesting, I saw last week, there's a very large church, if I mention their name, you probably know who they are. They believe that God has given them healing gifts. But they posted online that due to co concerns of COVID-19, that they were suspending their healing ministry and the teams would not be going into the hospitals. Now, I don't know what kind of self-awareness they have or how much self-delusion. It seems to me that if they have the gift of healing, now's the time. Deploy the troops. But that's because they really don't. See this again, just like this power to cast out the, the demonic that the twelve had, this power of, of healing that the twelve had, this is there's a shelf life. It's not it's not forever. Your your elders are not going to come to your home if you test positive for COVID nineteen and heal you from it. It's not gonna happen. Now what we will do is is pray for you. We will come and minister the word to you. We would never abandon any of the sheep that Christ has given to us to shepherd over. But we're not gonna we're not gonna operate exactly the same way that the twelve did in bringing healing. I can't heal. Yes, Pastor Nick's a doctor, but he can't heal you from COVID-19 either. None of the elders can. We don't have that healing power. But I do know a guy. I know a guy who can. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who gives this power and authority to the twelve, that it might testify to the coming of the kingdom, and it might testify to the fact that they are preaching God's word. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. His power and authority is not temporary. He is the one that grants and gives life and life abundant and peace. So it's important that you listen to what the CDC says and your doctor's recommendations. That's one of the ways that we as your elders and, and the deacons are prayerfully trying to navigate this as well. We have live streaming this morning for folks that are needing to self-quarantine or under situations where they might not need to be around crowds at the moment. So we're listening, but yet at the same time, we're not giving up the importance of the proclamation of God's word. But remember, even if you live in Chattanooga and you bought $17,000 worth of hand sanitizer, there is no amount of hand sanitizer that is going to ultimately heal you and protect you is going to stop the judgment that comes there is no quarantine that that will grant ultimate peace and joy for those things are found only in the lord jesus christ only jesus gives these things so my humble advice to you is turn off msnbc and fox you know it's out there We've all heard a thousand times what to do and, and start realizing the truth that your neighbors who are panicking and are anxious and fearful, your neighbors, what they need, they need to hear the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to hear the gospel. They need what the church has always been about, what the church's mission is. And that's why we see here that Jesus sends the twelve to proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus' sending of the twelve to proclaim the kingdom of God makes clear in and of itself what the kingdom of God is. Even how he, how he sends and how he, he goes about this proclamation of the kingdom makes it clear what it is. You know, the kingdom of God isn't a political kingdom. It isn't a geographical kingdom. It isn't a kingdom built on social justice or you name whatever the fad or fancy might be. Those are not the things that the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is not about campaigning for political parties, planting trees, or conducting protests. And those are all things that are claimed by some to be the kingdom of the God and how the kingdom of God and how it is advanced. That's not what the scriptures show us. The kingdom of God is, is now God's reign over the universe purposed in the redemption of the church. 
And then as we read from Daniel 7 and we touched on this, this now and not yet aspect of the kingdom of God, there is the coming future consummation of the kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth. Even as we saw that picture of, in Daniel 7 of the Son of Man, which is Jesus' favorite title for himself in the Gospels. As he has come and he is establishing here, we see the kingdom of God is established. And now he is beginning the advancement of it through the preaching of the word. What's interesting is, is Christ determines the way that his own kingdom arrives and advances. It even hopefully reminds us the fact that Christ gives different purposes, responsibilities, and roles to Christians and to the church at large. There are lots of things that, that Christians are called to do or can do that are good, but are not what God has called the church to do. Its mission it is not what's used to advance the kingdom of God. And the church gathers saints to the preaching of the gospel. The Holy Spirit is the one who, who comes to the elect and gives them life. They come, they're baptized, they and their families. And they are admitted into the family of God, adopted into the family. And then as that preaching is used by the Spirit and the, and the calling of the lost, that same preaching is used by the Spirit in, in the equipping of Christians that they might then be ready to go out and apply God's word to every square inch of life that they come in contact with, every square inch of culture and this world. So as the kingdom of God is, is advancing, we say in our passage here that, that Christ, that the Lord Jesus Christ sends the twelve to preach the gospel. Now he's given them this power he has dominion over the demonic. He has dominion over sickness. But they're sent to preach the gospel in the advancement of the kingdom of God. And we talked about this already. The, the elders at Covenant, all the elders across the church, across this world, right now they don't have the power and authority to cast demons out or to walk into hospitals and heal people. But they have been given the power and the authority to preach the gospel, to preach God's word, that the Spirit might use that in the advancement of the kingdom, the building up of the saints. And if we fully understand what happens, what's happening right now, it's not because Pastor John is preaching, but it's because the Spirit is working that's where the power is. That's the authority. It's in God. He is the one that is doing these things. And it's God's way, not man's way. And we turn to 1 Corinthians. In chapter 1, sorry, in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So some might hear earlier when I told you, when I said, you know, your neighbors, they're anxious, they're fearful, they're panicking. And you need to share the love of Christ with them and the hope that you have in the gospel. Now some that are in rebellion against God would hear that and say, that is utter foolishness. And again, God tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and onward, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
maybe even a little bit in the back of your mind or heart, you're like, man, this is, we're going to advance God's kingdom through preaching? Really? Yes. Yes. Yes, what, what the world looks at is foolishness. That's actually the power of God. And I get it. You look at me and you're like, yeah, I don't know how we're going to accomplish this. And that's fine. Because I look at myself and think the same thing. But Christ, it's not going to happen. But the things that we see as foolishness, the things that this world particularly sees as foolishness, that is what God uses, again, just to glorify himself, that we might not boast in anything but in Christ. 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit's been growing the kingdom through preaching. This world was turned upside down through preaching. And it wasn't because those disciples were smarter, wiser, more charismatic had nothing to do with that it was because the Holy Spirit worked through them the power and authority of God went forth and all that he had decreed his perfect will happened and is continuing to happen preachers are God's servants and the Holy Spirit uses the faithful preaching of the gospel and God's word as a means of grace to save and to sanctify You see here also that Jesus prepares the twelve for the reality that some will not believe the gospel. He prepares them for that in the way that he, he tells them how to go about this, this preaching tour that they're about to go out as they go from city to city and town to town to town preaching the gospel. He tells them not to take anything. Which is a little different because later in Luke, we're going to get to eventually, he actually says, uh, now nah, y'all need to make sure you have a sword and a bag and you need to have everything. But this time, he sends them out. Tells them to take nothing. He's going to provide for them completely. He tells them to go and as they are preaching the gospel, as they are utilizing his power and authority to testify to the truth of this word, testify to the coming of the kingdom as they are casting out demons as they are healing the sick that there will be those someone will come to them and say stay with me let me show you hospitality and jesus says but if no one does then he gives this very strange thing where he says shake the dust from your feet and leave see there was that time the, the ancient Jews as, as they would come back from a journey from Gentile lands right before they re-entered their homeland they would shake out their jackets and their coats and their sandals and they'd get all that dust off from where they just were I don't want to carry any of that in I'm done with it it's gone, I am away I'm, I'm home now well in the same sense of of finality. Christ said, look, there's going to be time. I'm going to, you're going to go into a, one of these little villages and you're going to preach the gospel and you're going to do the things that I've given you power and authority to do and no one is going to invite you to their house to stay. So I want you to shake that dust off and move on. And keep going. He's clear about that. There will be those who will not believe the gospel. There are others that God has for them to get to they're to be faithful and to move on as Jesus has prepared the way for them. So not everyone's going to believe. Not everyone we share the gospel with is going to believe. Not everyone we invite to church who comes and, and sees God's people worship. Not everyone will be converted. And that doesn't mean we stop praying for them and start sharing the gospel and the love of Christ, but, but at the same time, Saint, don't let that wreck your world. You got a lot of other neighbors. You got a lot of other folks you can share the hope of Christ with. Be faithful and trust God in the means that He's given to us in the advancement of His kingdom. 
So Jesus gives the 12 power and authority. Jesus sends the 12 to proclaim the kingdom of God because as we're looking here, the, the main thrust that I want you to remember is that God grows his kingdom through the faithful preaching of the gospel. You know, COVID-19 again, it's causing fear and panic and uncertainty. Some of the uncertainty is because we're uncertain. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned. Doesn't mean we need to panic. But it does point, as we mentioned, to the great need of God's grace and peace in all of our lives, but especially in those, those right now that are in the grips, the grips of fear and anxiety over something that, at least in their mind, is, is unstoppable to an extent. But in times of calm or crisis, whatever they may be, you'll, you'll remember we're told in all seasons to rejoice. So whether we are in a time of calm or a time of crisis, we trust the Lord. We pray without ceasing. We rejoice in God's goodness and his grace. We share the gospel with others. We share the love of Christ as we're able to. And we continue to support the preaching of the gospel here and around the world because that's what the Spirit's using to advance the kingdom. That's what God has chosen in his foolish way to glorify himself as he accomplishes the things that he has decreed from eternity past. May he be glorified in all things. Oh Lord, we do pray that you would be glorified in all things, especially in the saving of your people. Even as we look at it, and, and what we see is, and we're reminded of, of the great rebellion we have against you and our sinful nature, yet you loved us before we loved you. We have nothing to boast in but in Christ. So we ask that you would give us hearts that long to share the hope that we have with others, especially in a time right now that is full of anxiety and fear amongst many of our neighbors. Lord, may we be quick to share the love of Christ, to share the gospel, to bring your, your word to bear in a loving way, that we might encourage those who are in need of encouragement. But Lord, not in, in empty words. Might we encourage them with the only real hope there is, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Let us now respond to the reading and preaching of God's word by, by singing praises to our God and ministering to one another. So if you'll take hold of the blue Trinity hymnal in front of you, we're going to turn to hymn 170, Ferris Lord Jesus, hymn 170. If you're able, let's stand and sing together.
Now, remember with our current new schedule, we will not have evening worship tonight, but there are sermons that are posted on the front page of the church website that you and your families might utilize to listen to uh, this evening, this afternoon. Of course, we also have a large library of the sermons that have been preached by your pastors that you can listen to. So there's ample opportunities that you might, uh, as you stay at home this evening, still be able to be edified by God's word. So go out this week, share the hope that you have with Christ. Remember that those around you were in need of that hope. So share the gospel. And then for you, remember in here, God's blessing and his benediction that he's been giving to his church for thousands and thousands of years. The rock in whom our faith is placed upon. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace.